Hello, I am Fiona Sitkin, a former Fulbright scholar from Ukraine and now a board member of Fulbright New Jersey. I am happy to welcome you to the new edition of Fulbright New Jersey Speaker Series established a year ago in 2022. As you know, Fulbright Association is comprised of alumni, people currently on exchanges and supporters of international education. There are 54 US alumni chapters, at least one per state. New Jersey has over 300 active Fulbright alumni, as well as thousands of people who traveled abroad on Fulbright. Additionally, a great many foreign students, about 20,000 a year are coming every year to study in New Jersey colleges and universities. So educational exchanges benefit New Jersey economically and educationally. Fulbrighters come from 165 countries. And what ties us together is a commitment to advancing mutual understanding, tolerance, and intercultural cooperation worldwide. Isn't that a beautiful mission? Now, because Fulbright New Jersey is a diverse group, we've invited our members to share their stories and individual experiences. We also invite some guests. Well, some guests who are famous thought leaders or actors or artists. Why? Because we want to have a broader and deeper vision of the world, the world that is changing right before our eyes at a breakneck speed. We need to keep up and we will with international and intellectual curiosity. Think of our webinars as chances to meet interesting people, learn something new, and maybe enlarge your circle of friends and resources. As promised, today you will hear from a board member of Fulbright, New Jersey, Dr. Tina Lesher, a dynamic professor emerita at William Patterson University and a former newspaper reporter. We all know how important the media is in our day and time. And you'll hear about three things in Tina's storytelling. One, the beginning of journalism. Two, its progress in the US. And three, the role that women played, what they did and how they did it, how they made it to gain the equal place in today's media ecosystem. At the end of Tina's presentation, please ask your questions using Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Do you see it? You see it, you find it? Okay. Now, without further ado, I give you Dr. Tina Lesher. And now to you, Tina, the floor is yours. Okay, trying to share it. Okay. You want to share your presentation, I see. Yes, have I shared it yet? Uh, I don't see it yet. At the bottom, I'm looking for it to share. Uh-huh, to the right. No. Uh, no problem here, as I expected. You did share a screen. You. I'm trying to find at the bottom uh, where it says share screen at the bottom of the of the. Uh, right. Um, you do. See if we, we do it. Wait, wait. Let's see. Hang. Okay. All right. Okay. You don't see it. No. -uh. Share screen, then on your computer screen. You select the first slide and then to the right, another share, okay? Well, I gotta get the tech team in here. Tech team, Brendan? Well, I can share it if you wish. And you will just saying next, next. How about that? 
Yep, share right here. Okay, am I yeah. sharing it now? Uh -uh. Hi, Tina, uh, this is Christine. Your screen is shared, but it doesn't look like your PowerPoint is up. Uh huh. Did you open it, Tina? Yep, here we go again. There it is, okay. you got it? Same Let's good. Your screen sharing, okay? Okay, good. All right. Now we are on to a good start. Well, <laughs> good. Okay. Sorry, our friends. This okay. is Anne Newport Royal. You've, uh -huh. probably never, you've probably never heard of her. But in the 1820s, in the early 20s, Anne Newport Royal, a widow, started a publication in Washington, D.C. But she only had one real objective, and that was she wanted to interview the president of the United States. His name was John Quincy Adams, of course. He would have nothing to do with her. But then she found this out. He would go swimming naked every morning in the Potomac. So one day she gets up, she goes to the banks of the river, she finds his clothes, she sits on them and refuses to leave until he answers her questions. Now that story was legion throughout a century of journalism stories. But then not too long ago, a historian looking into this said, I don't think it ever happened. The year isn't right. She actually was a friend of Adams. Well, it's still being debated whether it happened or not. But for a hundred years, there was a, a big rock right on the spot where she held those clothes hostage. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I will tell you this. All historians agree that the first woman who ever interviewed an American president was this woman, Anne Newport Royal. This person we call Anna Zinger, very interesting person. She was married to a printer named John Peter Zinger. And we're talking about 1735. We weren't even a country. At the time, there was a British governor of New York, and you're not going to believe what his name was, Bill Cosby, William Cosby. He was really irritated by some of the articles in the journal that were actually written by lawyers because the printer Zinger was not talented enough to write. Well, Cosby got really irritated at one point, and he arrested John Peter Zinger, and he charged him with seditious libel and threw him into jail, where the man languished for nine months. During that time, Anna Zinger, his wife, stepped up to the plate. She learned how to put out that publication and in so doing, apprised the community of what was going on about the uh, trial that was impending. And when that trial was over, her husband was found not guilty. But what is really interesting is that two principles have come down from that trial in 1735 that we respect today. Number one, if you're sued, for libel, you have a right to the jury, uh, to a jury trial. And secondly, truth is a defense for libel. Anna Zinger now is credited with being the first woman publisher. Stories like this abound throughout journalism, as I said. And sometimes the stories are about women who are not journalism per, journalists per se, but just helped out. I can't find any women who actually covered the Revolutionary War, but I will tell you this. The paper mills up in Massachusetts were having a real problem. They couldn't get what they needed to make paper that we used for newsprint. Paper was made from the fibers of cotton and linen rags. So a plea went out, and you can see it in this publication, asking the women, take a bag, hang it from your kitchen ceiling over in the corner, put all your old rags in there, then they will be picked up and they were taken to the paper mills. And as a result, newsprint, newsprint was made, newspapers continued in the revolutionary era and women contributed without being journalists per se. I doubt if anyone here does not know what this is. In school, we were taught July 4th, 1776, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But the truth is, some of the men refused to sign that day because they were scared of being arrested for treason. They came back as a group on August 2nd, 
some signed then and some signed later. But no publication ever came to be of the entire declaration with the names of the signatories until January of 1777, six months after this, when this woman published it in her paper in Maryland, the Maryland Journal. At the time, women were not even allowed to be publishers unless their families owned the publication. In this case, the Goddards did. They had come from Massachusetts to Philadelphia and then to Baltimore. This woman also was the postmaster of Baltimore and reportedly the first woman postmaster in America. But in 1789, she was bounced from that job. She was removed and a male appointee got her job. The people in Baltimore were furious. They protested and they got nowhere. She wound up owning a bookstore, which she operated until 1809. Now I'm gonna tell you about some interesting women who scored firsts in the 1800s. Take a look at this woman. Her name is Jane Swisshelm. Well, if you've been to Pittsburgh, apparently there's a park named after her. She was doing some writing in Washington for the New York Tribune, but she was not allowed to go into Congress because the reporter's gallery was only open to men until April 17th, 1850, when Vice President Millard Fillmore allowed her to come in. She was the first woman ever to get in the reporter's gallery. And that day was unbelievable. Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri got in a tiff with Senator Henry Foote of Mississippi. He lunged at Foote and Senator Foote took out a gun, a pistol and aimed it at the Missouri Senator. And the place was chaotic. Nobody was hurt, but it became fodder for all of these cartoons. In fact, you can see in the back, that's Millard Fillmore. He's the Senate president trying to stop the whole thing with his gavel. Well, Jane writes up this story and the next day is printed on the front page of the New York Tribune. Two weeks ago, I, tra I tracked down this story and I found her to be fascinating. She's a really talented writer. In fact, I wasn't the only one that thought she was good. According to a Wisconsin newspaper, nobody but a regular woman could make a description of such a scene so interesting. That jerky, nervous, half breathless excitement which would embarrass the narrative of a man only adds piquancy and grace to that of a woman. Here's another woman who scored some firsts. This is Jenny June. Well, that's not really her name. They were all using pseudonyms. Her real name is uh, Crowley. Her last name is Crowley. And Jenny June, using that name, became the first syndicated columnist. She worked for a, I, I never heard a newspaper in New York called Noah's Times. She also founded a professional women's club, which became the National Gen uh, Federated Women's Club. But she's also listed as being the first female journalism professor. And that sort of surprised me. We didn't have journalism uh, schools until the next century, but we did have classes. And you're not gonna believe where she taught those classes. At Rutgers, our state university, which happens to be where my husband and yours truly went for our doctorates. Now over on the right, you'll see a book, if you can see it, uh, that she, published in 1866, a cookbook, American Cookery. The picture you see is actually my book. I ordered it a couple of weeks ago and it has a regular hard cover on it. But if you turn it inside, it's, it's the, uh, a copy of the original from the 1800s. Not only does she tell women in the beginning how to manage their households, she tells them make sure you're on time for dinner, but it says, that this includes more than 1,200 carefully selected and tested recipes. So I decided I would open up the book to see what recipe I might come across. And the recipe that I came across first, something you all want to eat, calves head hash. Mm -hmm. That was one of the better recipes. I actually couldn't believe it. So here's my gift to you. If there's someone here who wants this cookbook, please send me a note and it will be in the mail tomorrow because the Leshers are not gonna use that cookbook. Ida Wells, the most famous black woman in the United States of her time. She was born in 1862 and when she was in her early twenties, she was teaching school. She got on a train in Tennessee. She was sitting in the first class ladies car and the conductor came by and told her she had to move. 
that she was to go into the smoking car, which was absolutely packed at the time. And she said, no. He brought in another conductor and they dragged her out. She wrote about the experience for a church publication and then she hired a lawyer and she sued the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. She won in the initial circuit court. In fact, she got a $500 award. But when the case was then appealed to the Tennessee Supreme Court, the decision was overturned. And apparently this spurred her on to do a lot of writing, really credible writing. And the one thing she was interested in was documenting the horrors of lynching. She wrote two pamphlets in the 1890s and you can see the names there. In 2020, she was awarded a special citation posthumously for her extraordinary reporting on lynching. At the end of the 1800s, lots and lots of women were reading, some working on magazines. You know what I find absolutely incredible? Ladies Home Journal, which was start, started really at the beginning of the 1800s, by 1903, and I checked that today, it had a million subscribers. It doesn't even exist today. And now the famous Deli Bly. I assume some of you have heard of this woman. Well, that's not her name. Her real name is Elizabeth Cochran, C-O-C-H-R-A-N. She didn't like the name even as a kid. She put an E at the end of Cochran. It didn't matter because when she went to work in her first job in Pittsburgh, the editor said, now listen, I want you to use the byline Nellie Bly. That name actually came from a Stephen Foster song. So she spent a time, some time in Pittsburgh. She got a little disillusioned and she wanted to go to the center of American journalism. At the time it was Manhattan. She moved to New York for four months, had no job. And then the New York world, which was owned by Joseph Pulitzer hired her and said, We'd like you to do some investigative work. She really did the first investigative journalism. She signed herself into a mental hospital, spent 10 days there and wrote a series of articles that became a book. She also did some other work in the investigative arena, but she gained her most notoriety by this, an adventure she took. The, uh, some of you are familiar, of course, with the book Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, which was written in the 1870s. And it was about a fictional character who circumnavigated the, the world. Well, she wanted to see if she, in real life she could beat that 80 day record. Paper said fine. So she packed a bag. When I say a bag, she had hardly anything in it because she only took the dress she had on, the coat. That's all she took. She sailed out of Hoboken, she gets to Europe, she meets Jules Verne and then begins her trek around the rest of the world on every conveyance you can think of, from bike to rickshaw. The last leg, she comes into San Francisco on a ship and she is met there by a train sponsored by her newspaper in New York. So she can be, uh, she can go across country as quickly as possible on this train. I guess there were a couple of whistle stops, I don't know. And sure enough, she gets back to the New York area to Hoboken and she's made it in 72 days. She beats the record by eight days. And her stories were mesmerizing to people. She was sending them by telegraph, or if she couldn't, if she was somewhere where she couldn't, it took a while for them to get there, but people were just crazed by reading these stories. Now I'm gonna insert a personal a note here, if you don't mind. I might lose a daughter over it, but when my daughter was in fourth grade years ago, her class had a project on one day, and the, and the mothers would be invited to, the students were to show up dressed as famous people. I convinced my daughter to be Nellie Bly. She agreed, not even knowing who Nellie Bly was till I explained. And we went to the thrift store and bought her, I would think probably the ugliest dress the thrift store had. And I dressed her just like Nellie on the trip. And off we went to the fourth grade day when all the famous people showed up and you should have seen some of the other kids. My God, I think their parents paid a lot. They rented costumes, George Washington in full regalia and Dolly Madison. And here's my daughter. They couldn't even figure out who she was and she sort of looked like poor pitiful Pearl. Well, I have to tell you, she was not enthused by her mother's suggestion. The reason I'm telling you this is because she wound up not only with a bachelor's degree in journalism, but a master's in Columbia journalism. 
So a hundred years after that adventure, Nellie Bly has some influence in the Lesher household. Oh, whatever. She also had influence on some, for, uh, some uh, reporting that was done after her undercover work. She was so successful that other papers wanted to emulate what she did. And you know what they did? They hired stunt reporters, girls. They called them stunt, um, stunt women and stunt reporters. And what they were to do was to undertake some of the same kind of work that Nellie did. One woman, for example, in Chicago, she purposely fainted so she would get into the public hospital to unveil the ills there. Another pretended she was pregnant so she could go to the doctor's office and see if they were abortionists. But it got to the point, according to one critic, when the stories went from substantial to silly. And the girls apparently were getting so, some upset because some of the some of the assignments were actually dangerous. And so the period did not last that long, but it is pointed out in this book, Girl Stunt Reporters, which was just published a few years ago. And I thank my colleague from William Patterson, Liz Burge, for giving me that book. She keeps me in books. Now here's a muckraker, a woman who was part of that era. It was about a 10 year, um, I think it was about a decade long between the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, the muckraking era, meaning these were individuals who were investigative journalists who would write long pieces that were published in magazines and then became books. If you read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, you know that he investigated the meatpacking industry. By the way, the term muckrakers was given to them by Teddy Roosevelt. He took it from Pilgrim's Progress. You know, they're raking the muck. Well, Ida Tarbell was raised in the oil fields of Western Pennsylvania. And when I say raised, at one point, her family lived in a shack with 25 oil wells around it. When she became a credible, credible writer, and she was actually working for McClure's magazine, she decided to do an investigation of the Standard Oil Company. She was stopped so many times along the way as she tried to get documents. Rockefeller just would not let her get some of them. But she wound up writing the history of the Standard Oil Company. As a result of her writing, not only was the oil company um, met with its disillusion, but a number of federal laws were passed, antitrust laws and laws related to business. And it was because of Ida Tarbell. Now at this point, and we're talking the 20, it went into the you know, beginning of the 1900s, you're going up into 1920 or so. And there are a lot of women working on papers, but they're mostly in the, what we call soft news, you know, social, the arts, food. And that's where they were for a long time, by the way, let me tell you. Well, this particular woman, Dorothy Dixon, that's not her real name even. I think her real name is Elizabeth Meredith. She actually started out doing some regular reporting. She covered a couple of court cases, but what she really wanted to do was to be an advice writer. So in 1923, she started a column, which went on for a couple of decades. She became the highest paid woman in American journalism. And people would say, oh, I wanna be Dorothy Dixed, meaning I want advice. Her column was at one point in 273 papers. And those of you my age who might remember the Honeymooners on TV, Ralph Cramden, Jackie Gleason, in one episode is having some spat with his wife, Alice, and he says, oh, where is Dorothy Dix when I need advice on my marriage? She was a very popular advice columnist prior to what we have today, Dear Abby and those. I thought I should mention this person, Ann O'Hare McCormick, because she was married to apparently a wealthy businesswoman who went back and forth to Europe and she would go with her. So she goes to the New York Times in the 1920s and she says, and she has some background in writing, could I interview people in Europe? And then I, if you would hire me as a staff member, I will do that. And the paper said, no, you cannot be a regular staff member, but if you want to do some interviews, go ahead. You know, you'll be a correspondent. Well, before World War II, Anne McCormick interviewed Hitler, Stalin, um, I think she, Winston Churchill, Mussolini, incredible interviews. And then back in New York in the 1930s, in 1936 to be exact, 
she did get a regular job with the New York Times. She was named as the first woman on the editorial page and you can see her, she's in the back. She's the only woman. A year later, she was named winner of the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting for her correspondence. She was the first woman ever honored with the Pulitzer Prize for a journalism category. And there would be no other winner for another 14 years. Oh, what about radio? Well, Mary Margaret McBride was a newspaper woman, she lost her job when the crash came in 2930s. Someone said to her, why don't you go on the radio? She knew nothing about it. She wound up with this show that was targeted to homemakers. It's one o'clock and here's Mary Margaret McBride because that's when apparently it was on the radio and it lasted for a few decades. She got to interview everybody. There she is with Mrs. Roosevelt who herself did some newspaper work, but she interviewed men, women, and her target audience, as I said, with the homemakers. Now, if you wanted to advertise a product on her radio show, she insisted that she try it out first. She would have nothing to do with tobacco, nothing to do with alcohol. And the thing about it is, I, I was trying to figure out if my mother, for example, actually listened to this. I'm sure we had a radio before television. I was never really familiar with this woman. And the reason that I have a picture of a flower there is because in the 1940s, somebody decided to cultivate or create, I don't know what you do, a flower that is called the Mary Margaret McBride tea rose. Still exists. You can order it, I guess. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be nice to have a flower named after me? <laughs> like the Tina Lesher orchid or something. Well, it's not going to happen. Well, really serious women journalists, they looked askance at this woman because they said, if you're on the radio during the day, you're not really credible. In fact, what they did was call our listeners the dustpan army. Well, one of those who was critical of her was this woman, Martha Gellhorn. If you are an aficionado of the Hemingway books, you probably would know her name because she was wife number three for Ernest Hemingway. It wasn't a very happy union, but during World War II, with so many men journalists being called to regular service, women did have an opportunity to, to go to Europe and to cover some of the war. She was one of them. Now, the Normandy is coming, D-Day is coming. She applies actually through the British to get media accreditation and she is rejected as was every other woman who applied. So what she did was this. She surreptitiously got herself on a hospital ship she went into the bathroom and locked herself in there for two days until it got to the point where they couldn't get rid of her. Then several hours after the landings on the beaches, she left the ship, apparently in the company with a few men, and she became the only woman to land in Normandy the day the troops did. And when she got there, she realized what was going on and she decided to be a stretcher bearer. She wrote a lengthy story about her experience, it was in Collier's Magazine. The cover of that edition is pictured here. I never read the story, but apparently it has most to do with the marvelous work done by medical personnel during that period. And by the way, when she was way up in age, Martha Gellhorn committed suicide. Isn't that ironic, considering how Hemingway met his demise? Korea. Oh, there were a number of photographers, including Margaret Burke White, who were there. But to me, the interesting person was Marguerite Higgins. She worked for the Herald Tribune and she became the Tokyo bureau chief. That was a real big deal. Then Korea breaks out. She goes over there. She even covered at least uh, one invasion, I think, in Incheon. But what happens is one of her colleagues shows up. His name is Herman Bigart, B-I-G-A-R-T. And he says to her, now listen, I'm taking over coverage for our newspaper. You've got to leave. And she says, no. And then a Marine general tells her she has to leave the country. And she says, no. Finally, she goes to Douglas MacArthur and the general apparently allows her to stay because in 1951, in a really unusual move, the Pulitzer Prize Committee gave five awards in international reporting to four men and to Marguerite Higgins, and they cited her for the extraordinary reporting as a woman in Korea. And by the way, one of the four men that won the Pulitzer with her 
Homer Bigger, the guy who wanted her to leave. Now, as I wind down, I'm gonna go back into some personal notes. Those of you here who grew up in Scranton, I know some of my friends are here, will recognize this. This is the 1960s in Scranton, that's where I grew up. And for those of you who are not from Scranton, I just wanna tell you that that happens to be on Wyoming Avenue, which intersects with what we knew as Spruce Street, which of late has been rechristened Biden Street, yeah, Scranton. Well, I left Scranton and I was at the University of Missouri School of Journalism for graduate studies for my master's. And then I came back to Scranton. And this is why I'm telling you what it was like. I'm a dinosaur. There were two papers, morning and evening. I was working at the morning paper. Each paper would only employ two women in the newsroom. All of us, all four of us, college graduates and more, could only work on the social pages. We were not considered good enough to be regular reporters. In fact, it was in the 1960s before we even got equal pay. And after that, the union even tried to stymie our raises. To me, it was incredible when I think about it. This was the 1960s, my era. Now, Linda Greenhouse, who became well-known as a New York Times reporter, she was at Harvard in the late 60s. And she was doing some stringing work, correspondent work, writing stories about what was going on at the university. So now she wants to go for a job. She applies to that same newspaper. They wouldn't even give her an interview, she said. Boston Globe wouldn't even interview her because she said these newspapers had no interest in hiring women. We're talking about the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. Now, a number of women were working at the New York Times in different jobs. They, they weren't photographers, but they were in some of the soft news jobs. They were copy editors. They were regular reporters, but in the 70s, they charged that paper with sex discrimination. And you can see what, what the stats were. It was finally settled. The women were not happy with the settlement force, but you can read about this in a really interesting book. It came out 20 years later, actually 1992. And it's called The Girls in the Balcony. And it's written by the Pulitzer Prize winning um, reporter, Nan Robertson. And she tells about what happened in the seventies. And she also profiles some really interesting New York uh, women New York Times women from over the years. But the girls in the balcony, that means this, the title. So in Washington was a national press club. Only men were members. They would have regular luncheons with top-notch newsworthy speakers, including women. But no woman was allowed to attend those luncheons. Oh, there were other men. They'd invite legislators and business people and along with the members. So if a woman reporter wanted to hear the speech given by someone who was newsworthy, she had to go to the balcony. She couldn't ask any questions. And Debbie Angelo of Newsday wrote about this. She said it was so hot, it was boiling. And she called it discrimination at the Rost. Girls in the balcony. By the way, Nan Robertson won the Pulitzer Prize, as I recall, for what I think was one of the most emotional stories I have ever read about her fight with toxic shock syndrome. I don't wanna leave without telling you about Helen Thomas because you probably recognize her name. She was the Dean of the White House Press Corps, meaning I think her chair had her name on it. She was always in the front. She always said, thank you, Mr. President. She was there for decades, first with UPI and then later with Hearst. But a dozen years ago, she made some insensitive remarks about Jews. And as a result, her White House days were over. She wound up for one year writing a column for the Falls Church, Virginia uh, weekly. And actually uh, she died three years after she left the White House. But the thing is, she was the first woman officer of the National Press Club and she was a president at one time of the White House correspondence. Now, women have moved into top newsroom jobs. We know we're losing the number of newspapers, but I just want to tell you that it took Jill Abramson. She finally got to be executive editor, first one, 2011 New York Times. Then she gets fired. She said, the higher women go, the more disliked they are, which is not true for men. I listed here two names of people, women who are in the top positions editorially at their publications. And just remember that the number of newspapers has declined dramatically. So women are looking for other things to do, but they do have an opportunity if they want to be in top jobs now. 
Today, journalism schools are mostly female, especially in the graduate ranks. And when they finish school, they're going not only to, you know, newspapers aren't around too much, but some of them are going right into academia, public relations and other things. But where most of them would be interested in going would be to television. And so the past few decades, we have seen women ascend the ranks on television. Here are some of the pioneers. And I don't know if you recognize on the left, that's Sally Quinn. She had a really short reign on, as an anchor. She's from the Washington Post, but I put her picture there anyway. And finally, those people in television journalists, journalism, they all showed up the day that Barbara Walters retired. It was on The View. And you can see the names there. Connie Chung and uh, Hoda is there and Oprah and Jane Paul and they're all there. And the thing is, I'm, as I finish this, let me say that all of these women you're looking at now, they probably have stories. And those are stories that you should hear in the future, but not by yours truly, because I don't know them. As for me, thanks for listening. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much, Tina. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. Let's give Tina a hand. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you, everyone. Thank so you. Much. And I apologize that we had some technical difficulties. At it's the okay. Lecture book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, um, are you ready for the questions? Anybody ask a question? Well, let us see. Not, not yet, but um, well. Um, Would you like to add something to your presentation? Well, I just want to thank my friends for showing up here. It's going to cost me a lot of lunches. I'm perfectly <laughs> cognizant of that, and I'm willing to do it. But um, you know, I, I have to tell you that I actually, I personally like 19th century journalism. Some of these women I'd never even heard of, but I thought they were interesting. Uh, we have two questions, by the way. Oh, no, really? Yeah, Cassie Guy. Oh. I have been to the National Press Club many times and have never heard of the women on the balcony. Well, what would you comment? Well, that ha Kathy Guy happens to be my niece. She's the daughter of my late marvelous sister, Nancy K. Holmes, after whom the library in Scranton is named. And Kathy probably has been, yes. I don't know why she never, I'm gonna have to send her the book, I guess. Um, but I have to tell you, the women were allowed in that club uh, as of 1955. In fact, I was there for dinner in the, in the probably in the 60s. But they were only allowed in certain places, apparently, and they could not become members. And that didn't happen until 1971. But uh, that book is really, really interesting. Yeah, that's my niece, Kathy. She's, and by the way, she lives in Falls Church, so she must have been reading the column that was written by Helen Thomas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have um, another question from Diana Peck, oh. who wants to ask, what did it take for you to move from the society pages to news editing and reporting? Well, uh, first of all, Diana Peck is Dr. Diana Peck, who was the chairman of my department at William Patterson when I was hired and when I retired. Yeah, in between, she wasn't the chairman and she just retired. Um, here's the thing, Diana knows this. I, uh, I left Scranton in 1970, 1970. I worked, and I've done a presentation about, about being there. So I went to the Philadelphia Inquirer and I went as a copy editor, okay? Mm -hmm. And at the time, this is 1970, that newsroom had uh, several women in it, but they were all on soft news. There was one woman on general assignment and she left right after I came. So uh -huh. even in 1970, I couldn't get a job as a regular reporter. So I worked on the copy desk. But here's the thing. I was on the copy desk about four or five months. The paper was purchased by night newspapers. And I asked if I could be a reporter. Uh -huh. Two months later, I'm called into the office of the managing editor. I never even met him. Paper is so big, you never even met the guy. And he said, we've decided you can be a reporter. I was so thrilled, right? Uh -huh. I walked back to the copy desk and they tell me there's a phone call for me. I, I can't make these things up. There's a phone call for you. I said, okay, who is it? Nobody ever called me there. 
It was from my doctor to tell me that I was expecting my first child. So uh -huh. I never did become a John finished Wharton school and we left town. So from uh -huh. then on, I was, yeah. but that's, and Diana knows how important news editing is because she took news editing at Columbia. Okay. And I happen to think it's the most important case. Uh, of course yeah. you can take it journalism school. She knows that. Yeah. We have a comment from Cassie Guy <laughs> who says, I did follow Helen Thomas's column in the Fall Church News Press. Huh? Well, mm -hmm. Whatever. Now, um, another question from Matthew Orso. What's the greatest story you ever covered? Huh? People ask me that all the time, and there wasn't any story that I covered. When I was stuck on the women's page, I mean, what would you cover? In fact, um, I always tell people, to, this is what happened, for example. We weren't even considered this good. I was working one Sunday in Scranton. And I was there alone and uh, with a photographer and we, the police report said plane crash in the Cathedral Cemetery. We went over there, it was a one, one pilot deal. He didn't get hurt, but I got the whole story. I talked to everybody, okay? Uh -huh. Wrote the story. Do you think it made the front page the next day? Uh-uh. There was a police report based story on the front page. Mine was way back because they were not gonna put, they did not think that we were regular reporters. So uh -huh. I, Tina Lesher, I became a religion writer, by the way, in New Jersey. I, huh. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but that's the only way that Gannett would hire me $20 a week. And I did get one of no. the things I am very proud of right after I started that uh -huh. um, the, in Plainfield, New Jersey, there was a big to do with the Christian Science Church having huh. a, some sort of an argument with the mother church. And I did cover that and I made the front page. So I have done some stories, but as far as general assignment reporting, I'm from the era, it just didn't happen. Uh, bravo. Good. But now I have, we have, we have good, more questions. Well, I just want to tell you, I assume, uh -huh. I assume that in America today, I am the most seasoned wedding writer. Yeah. I well, have written millions of weddings. That's a great achievement, I believe. No, I don't think so. No. Uh, well, whatever, you know better. Now, here's a question from Carolyn Fleder. Oh, gosh. Could you comment on women in journalism in UAE today after your tenure there? You Excuse went from Fulbright to the Emirates, right? Yeah. So um, what about the women in journalism there, if this Oh, exists? okay. Yeah, oh. well, Carolyn knows yes. I, I me. I twice lived in the United Arab Emirates. And I really had to watch myself when I was teaching at Zayed University. Here's the thing. Unlike in the United States, a newspaper uh, reporter can ne never, ever criticize the government or uh. he or she would be on the next plane out. So I, when I was teaching, I really had to watch that. It was a completely different approach to teaching, but I never had any problem with it because I recognized it. And then when I wrote a book, a novel, um, you can probably see behind me, there's a big article from one of the UAE papers, big article about me writing a book uh, about the, the women and it was a novel. And so they were very gracious to me, the newspapers, because I didn't step on any toes. But right now, it's a whole different ball game with uh -huh. your, your covering over there. I don't know if that's Carolyn's question. But... Uh -huh. Well, all right. Um, let's go to the next question, will you? Um, the next question comes from Deborah Levine uh, from Chattanooga, who happens to be one of my book subjects. And Deborah asks, Ruth Holmberg in Chattanooga was edited decades ago. How many women reporters became editors? Huh? Well, I don't, I don't know all the uh, specs about that, but um, in all the places that I was associated with, um, there were men editors. I mean, the uh, in my day and age, I don't I don't remember any woman being an editor. But today, it's I think it's pretty common. And right now, uh -huh. you know, we had I read we had like twenty thousand newspapers in the twenties. We're down to under two thousand now, and things have changed so dramatically. But um, and so a lot of women could rise to the level of editor now, but uh, they just it just didn't happen for years and years and years and years. I don't know about Chattanooga, but believe me. Scranton never had it. Uh huh. Philadelphia, okay. I don't think did. Uh, 
it's uh, and the reason, by the way, those of you, Diane asked this question, being on the copy desk is probably the best experience to learn how to be a better writer. Uh -huh. I went to, I worked on the copy desk, not only at the Philadelphia Inquirer, but at the Hartford Current. By the way, copy editors in the union get paid more than reporters, so that helped. And um, both of those papers claim to be the first mm -hmm. uh, American regular, I don't know, daily paper or something, both of them. Anyway. If I look at what I wrote over the years before I was on the copy desk and compared it to my writing later, I was a much better writer, absolutely much better writer after being on the copy desk because I really learned how to excise words and to make uh, writing better. But yeah, yeah, you say? I'm, no, I'm no expert in anything, you know? Well, all right, all right. Now here is a comment from Matthew Orso, oh. which says, Thank you for everything you taught us at William Patterson. Ah. Well, Matthew Orso was one of the editors of Pioneer Times, which no longer exists, unfortunately. It was a workshop paper that I started in the department. And I just grabbed him out of class one day. I think he was a sophomore, right, Matt? And today, Matthew is the uh, owner of at least two Emmy Awards. Wow. For his, he's written in college. He had already written two books on baseball. So he is one of my extraordinary students, but I had nothing to do with this baseball stuff. And he was a very talented student. Yes, uh, we had some really good times, but he's been, he's made our department very proud. Thank you. And thank you for being a good teacher, you know, who <laughs> produced excellent students uh, who continue your work. That's the best compliment the teacher could have. Yes. All right, I think there are no more questions. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, not good. I could have listened to you for years, maybe, you know, for hours. For years, You're well, like a okay. Brilliant okay. storyteller, you know, well, and that, the that, same that's thing I didn't point. know. Yeah. And I think the audience is very grateful. So let's give Tina a hand. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Come bye. again to Fulbright, New Jersey. Okay, bye-bye.